Hello beautiful light skinned ladies and welcome back to the channel. This is the first episode of a new series I'm doing called Black Scholars Silencing Light Skinned Black Women. And yes, Black Scholars are indeed silencing light skinned Black women through various ways, through their research methods, through the half truths that they tell on social media and in their actual uh, journals and articles in their findings. We're going to unpack all of this one video at a time. And today I'm going to be showing you a video that was posted on TikTok from a black therapist who decided to speak about color discrimination as it pertains to lighter skinned people. I think what she says is very interesting and a prime example of this agenda to silence light-skinned Black women and also light-skinned Black people in general and to also dismiss our very unique experience. And if you're new to my channel, welcome. My name is Dolce K. I like making content that centers light-skinned Black women and our experiences. So I talk about color discrimination, multiculturalism, feminine strategy, and I also make critical content aimed at deconstructing the negative beliefs, stereotypes that we have learned from the Black community about what it means to be a light-skinned Black woman and replace those with positive tools and positive beliefs and practices to reaffirm our self-esteem and our confidence in our identity as light-skinned Black women. So if that sounds like something you're interested in, hit the like and subscribe button. If you have no interest in that, please click off the video. This isn't for you. What do you call it when colorism happens to light-skinned people? The question of what to call it when light-skinned folk experience colorism has been long contested, long debated, but let me lay that to rest. But first, let me rewind. Hey, sunshine. I'm Dr. Donna Oriowo, sex and relationship therapist in the Washington, D.C. area, helping black women feel free, fabulous, and effed. That F, as you know, is for the algorithm. And the thing is, part of my specialty as a therapist is in how colorism and texturism impact mental and sexual health and esteem. So to answer this question, I call it color-based prejudice. I do not call it colorism and I don't call it colorism because the ism implies the system. And there are no systems in place to discriminate against light skinned somebodies. There are systems in place to, to uh, denigrate and harm dark skinned somebodies. And you can tell because it's a worldwide phenomena where even health outcomes look different for dark skinned black women. Where housing, income, all areas of life are actually impacted by the skin tone that you have. So it is not just enough to only be black. It's also about how that blackness appears to the outside world. So when we're talking about this, I need us to remember that the reverse doesn't exist in the same way that for sexism or for um, racism, that there is no reverse, right? Because there is no power in being a woman. There is no power in being um, in being black or of color right the power lies with white people just as the power lies with men and the power also too lies with light-skinned folk now i know that for some people they're like well i don't understand how that could be i don't feel like i have no power because i'm still black well i'm gonna i'm gonna give it to you the same way that um i seen it earlier on um on facebook or something like that but the privileges that you have is not about what you get always, but it is about what you don't have to deal with. And light skinned folks simply do not have to deal with their skin tone being the hindrance for them being able to make it to where they want to go to. It's simply not the obstacle. Now, a lot of people will say that it's still called colorism, but those people would be wrong. And clearly they didn't study that. And that's okay because we don't all know. We don't know what we don't know until we know. This is your moment to know. It doesn't mean that it hurts less. It doesn't mean that your experience is invalid, but what it does mean is that it does not exist in reverse. That is something that I need us to know. So colorism happens to dark skinned people. Color-based prejudice 
happens to light skin folk. All right, y'all, sound off in the comments. Where are you with this? Okay, so I actually agree with everything she said about skin tone being a factor in housing, income, and healthcare. I've actually seen that data myself, so 100% agree with that. With that being said, if you are not a light-skinned Black woman, do not get in my comments trying to defend your lived experience because I'm not invalidating it, and no one is. In fact, you have a ton of Black scholars and Black doctors validating your experience day in and day out. But what I find very interesting is that these same people like to go out of their way to invalidate and dismiss the experiences of light-skinned people and even go so far as to tell lies about it. See, the question was very fucking simple. Excuse my language. The question was very simple, okay? It was, what do you call it when light-skinned Black people experience colorism? What's interesting about this question is that it shows a willingness to use another word other than colorism. And I think that willingness went over her head. She didn't even recognize it. Now, she did offer another phrase. She said color-based prejudice, but most of her comments were not about color-based prejudice. She didn't define what color-based prejudice is. She didn't give an example of it. And she definitely didn't describe how it's harmful to the light-skinned Black people who experience it. Instead, she chose to focus mostly on why light-skinned Black people can't experience colorism when that wasn't the question. The question was not, why do you think light-skinned Black people can't experience colorism? The question was, what do you call it when Black people experience, for lack of other words, colorism? What do you call it? They don't know anything else to call it other than colorism. So what do you call it, right? She could have easily answered this question without all of that extra fluff. She could have easily gone to any United States government website Pull the definition that I'm showing you now, and this definition of color discrimination applies to all skin tones, all races, even Caucasians who are supposedly at the top of the racial hierarchy. And this is being enforced by our Title VII Civil Rights Act, so it's literally ingrained into our rights as an American. That's a simple, easy answer. So I just find it very interesting that she chose to tell lies to twist the meaning of words and to impose her racial hierarchy mindset on her viewers all so she could justify this distorted and dismissive view of what light-skinned black people don't experience. Let's start off with the way that she misrepresented the meaning that these words actually have. This is a common trend that I see among Black scholars who are responsible for creating the discourse around colorism and Black women's experiences, which includes light-skinned Black women. Often, they will move the goalpost by creating new meanings that these words previously did not have or new definitions that these words previously did not have. And I understand that language evolves, but as it stands, the dictionary does not support the way that this woman defined colorism. Alice Walker's definition doesn't support it. The United States government definition of color discrimination doesn't support the way that she defined colorism. So where is this coming from when she says ism implies a system and that's a part of defining colorism? The ism is just a grammatical suffix that can have multiple meanings. It can allude to a phenomenon, an attitude, a practice, a belief. It does not inherently require a formal system or a hierarchy or an institution. So her argument is complete bullshit. I want to point out that none of the definitions of colorism talk about systems. Okay, so colorism here, and this is Wikipedia, says it's defined as a form of prejudice and discrimination in which people of certain ethnic groups, uh, you know, are treated differently based on their different skin tone. It doesn't say anything about a system. Alice Walker's definition doesn't say anything about a system. 
even the uh, definition from the actual dictionary that does make it, you know, a one-way street that does talk about, oh, it only happens to dark-skinned people, even that definition says nothing about a system. But let's find out what the definition of system actually is, okay? So a system is a set of things working together as parts of a mechanism or an interconnecting network. All right. So it's basically anything that anything that comes together to create a network. So uh, if you have, let's say, the NAACP, that's a network. Uh, the HBCUs, that, that's a network. Here's another definition a set of principles or procedures according to which something is done an organized framework or a method and i think that's what she is referring to but both of these definitions are absolutely valid the public school system as is referenced in the second definition is just as real as the state railroad system they may be two different systems that affect two different areas of your life, but they are still systems. So if you're walking into a setting where you're walking into, you're having to operate within a system that is gatekept and reinforced by black people, such as an HBCU or any black organization, I think what we forget here is that there are black people in power. There are black people school systems. There are uh, black workplaces. There are black owned businesses. People really do forget that there are black people in power. And so I, I think that's why she used that word system is because she's primarily thinking about, uh, I guess, white institutions or institutions of white America that we do find ourselves having to operate in, but we're also operating within black systems as well. Those black systems do exist. Misrepresenting the definition of colorism is just so harmful because it takes away from the nuanced experiences of black women based on our skin tone and makes it more about a competition of oppression Olympics. We're stuck debating about whether or not it's about light-skinned Black people or if it's just about dark-skinned Black people. We're still debating about whether or not it's about how non-Black people treat Black people or how about Black people treat each other. There are all these questions swimming around people's minds when it comes to this topic that it has created so much confusion. And the Black scholars and doctors that are speaking about this are responsible for creating that confusion. Meanwhile, no one is talking about how color discrimination has already been defined by the United States government for all people, for all skin tones, and that color discrimination is illegal. And it is your right as an American to not have to experience color discrimination. That is your Title VII Civil Rights, uh, Civil Rights Act rights. But if that wasn't already harmful enough with misrepresenting the facts of what these words mean, she even went further to talk about how being light-skinned does not hinder us in making it to where we want to go. And based on our collective experience, especially what I see you guys commenting down in my videos, what I've experienced, what I've seen in my family, that's just not true. And it's funny that she's speaking on it when she's not a light-skinned Black woman. Like I mentioned before, there are Black people in power. There are Black hiring managers. There are Black employers. And while these people in power you know, the NAACP, the HBCUs, the Black Chamber of Commerce, while these people in power and their organizations may not have the power to affect a white person's life and a white person's access to resources, they damn sure can affect a light-skinned Black woman's access to resources. And I'm so sure 
you probably know someone or you are that person, that light-skinned Black woman who has experienced not being able to access resources within your community because you were ostracized by the Black community, by other women in your community because they see your light skin as proximity to whiteness. So they feel like you don't even deserve access to these resources because somehow you're able to get them elsewhere outside of the Black community when that may or may not always be the case. So I definitely disagree with that. And not only do I disagree with it, I'm offended that she even said that because she's in a way speaking for us. And that's not right at all. And I always find it ironic that the Black scholars that are talking about this do not talk about the Black people who are in power and have the ability to affect other Black people's lives the ability that they have to affect our lives as light-skinned Black women. Black organizations can withhold resources from Black people. It happens all the time. The only evidence that she provides to support this misrepresentation of facts and this distorted view about what we experience in the Black community and how our light skin affects our ability to gain resources is the hierarchy mindset. She uses the racial hierarchy mindset to support everything that she's saying. Notice that she uses the words not enough. She says it's not enough to only be black. Your blackness must look a certain way, basically, to gain victim privilege, to gain the privilege of being able to say that you experience colorism. That to me was kind of a moot point because it's like you just said that color based prejudice is what you would call it when a light skinned black person experiences something similar to colorism, you know, so why are you now talking about how, you know, it's not enough to just look black that you have to be darker skin in order to have this level of oppression or have this particular experience. And it's all rooted in her misrepresentation of facts, her misrepresentation of what ism means, the fact that she's saying that it all relies on uh, there being a system there to oppress you when, in fact, there are systems there to oppress light-skinned Black people. It's just that those are Black systems. But she's not going to recognize that because of the racial hierarchy mindset. And that's what she spirals into explaining in the rest of her video. She just starts spiraling into a racial hierarchy and a minority hierarchy mindset babble. A couple of things that she said that was quite disturbing. She said that there was no reverse of colorism. Okay, well, if there's no reverse of colorism, tell me why the United States government says that even Caucasians can experience color discrimination. Wouldn't the reverse of colorism be someone discriminating against a, a person because of their skin tone and that person is not a dark skinned person? Okay, well, the United States believes that it can happen. That's why it has laws illegalizing color discrimination of anyone of any skin tone. Doesn't matter if it's a darker skinned person who's discriminating against someone or a lighter skinned person who's discriminating against a darker skinned person. It doesn't matter which way it goes. So that's false. You don't even call it reverse colorism, see? They make these words and then make new words. It's just called color discrimination. Then she says there's no reverse of sexism after saying that there's no power in being a woman. Well, have you heard of misogyny? The opposite of misogyny is misandry. So those things definitely exist. It is very possible for a woman to be sexist towards a man. That happens every day and cases are filed in the court of law about it. But this comment about there is no power in being a woman was very interesting. And it's a sign that she has internalized some of the, uh, the traumatic history of this country. The fact that we do live in a patriarchal society uh, does not necessarily mean that women have no power at all. It really does beg the question of what do you gain by professing to the entire world that there is no power in being dark skinned, there is no power in being black, there is no power in being a woman. 
What do you gain from that? Oh, that's right, victim privilege, which is why she makes her next point of, well, it's not about what you don't have, it's not about the power that you have, it's about what you don't have to deal with. Okay, so because your oppression isn't exactly the same as my oppression that automatically gives me power. And it's interesting because she equates power with proximity to whiteness. And remember, all of this stemmed from a simple question, what do you call it when light-skinned Black people experience colorism? In other words, I don't know what else to call this. I don't want to use the word colorism, but what would you call it since you're an educated mental health therapist? What would you call it if a light-skinned Black person has trauma around their skin tone because of how they were treated? Instead of just simply answering that question and providing resources, she spiraled out of control talking about what light-skinned Black people don't have to deal with. Can you imagine being a light-skinned Black woman and you're trying to access mental health resources and you don't feel comfortable choosing a white therapist, you don't feel comfortable choosing an, an Asian therapist, you actually feel most comfortable choosing a Black a black therapist. And because you're not a colorist, you don't care what skin tone they are. And you end up with Dr. Donna Oriolo, and you end up telling her about your trauma surrounding your skin tone. And she tells you, oh, but you still have power because you don't have to deal with X, Y, and Z. I have no reason to believe, we have no reason to believe that that mental health therapist would be of any help to any light-skinned Black woman who came to her with those particular traumas. Because when she was asked to address those particular traumas, this is what she had to say instead. So in the upcoming episodes, I will be exposing and demonstrating to you how Black scholars like to duck and evade and avoid talking about the trauma of being light-skinned Black in the Black community and what it's like to experience what they like to call in-group colorism as a light-skinned Black person. Because what she did was actually very predictable. She misrepresented the meaning of words. There are other Black scholars who I have seen do exactly the same thing. And then she dismissed and told lies basically about our experience or completely refused to talk about it at all, which is something that Black scholars have been doing in research. And then lastly, she basically just spammed us with a bunch of racial hierarchy mindset babble, <laughs> which is exactly what I see other Black scholars doing. So this is gonna be very interesting. But before I end this video, I do want to provide you with some uh, empowerment. And I wanna make sure that we're not using this to bash anyone or to express uh, hatred. That's not the point of this video at all. If I sound angry or if I sound passionate, it's not because, oh, this person needs to see things the way that I see it. It's because I can clearly see, and I have seen the evidence that light-skinned black women are being silenced and there's propaganda and research articles being made every day to discourage us from exercising our Title VII Civil Rights Act, to discourage us from speaking up when we experience color discrimination. A lot of times people will say, oh, you're inserting yourself into the conversation. No, this is a completely different conversation about us that centers us. No one is talking about what we experience. That's what this video is about. This video is about exposing an opportunity for light-skinned Black women to realize that this is the time to start speaking up for yourself, to start exercising your Title VII rights, because no one else is going to do it for us. The Black scholars aren't going to do it for us. The Black people in power aren't going to do it for us. So let's do it for each other. And with that, thank you so much for watching and have an amazing day. And if you made it to the end of this video, I hope you thoroughly enjoyed it as much as I did. Thank you so much for watching. Please leave a like and subscribe and be sure to follow me on buymeacoffee.com where I am posting exclusive blogs, 
free vlogs and making membership content as well. So if you're interested in that exclusive content, feel free to follow me over there as well. Thank you so much and have an amazing day.